Hello and welcome. It's day five of the Betfred World Snooker Championship. I'm delighted to welcome semi-finalist from 1979. Should be part of the BBC commentary team, but uh, he's with us for the next 10 minutes or so. John, how are you doing? I'm okay. Uh, buenos dias, as they say in Spain. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, let, let, let's just explain again in case no one saw the last uh, episode with you. Unfortunately, you were due to be working for the BBC as always, but... Uh, yeah. You're living in Spain nowadays, and because of the quarantine rules, you, you can't fly over. No, no. Uh, they said you've got to isolate 14 days, which obviously doesn't apply to the Real Madrid team because they're playing Man City tomorrow night in Manchester. So, uh, well, obviously one rule for them and one rule for me. British citizen paid me tax all these years, and I don't get any compensation. But there you go. That's life. Well, uh, there's plenty of mixed messages at the moment, isn't there, about this virus? I think the most important one is to stay safe. And most importantly as well, John, at times I never thought we were going to get the Betfred World Snooker Championship, but we have. And look, is there enough superlatives in the dictionary to, de to describe Ronnie O'Sullivan? No. Uh, the, the, the thing is, any snooker player, what they want to do, they want to bring their practice game to the match table. And that's exactly what Ronnie O'Sullivan did the other day. To be fair, and I did say it before the match, that Tip Chion knew was the perfect opponent. Wouldn't slow him down, wouldn't get into long bouts of safety. And it seemed that every time Ronnie came to the table, he had a pot on. Well, you can't afford to do that against the likes of Ronnie O'Sullivan. And, you know, the likes of Judd Trump as well. So, I'm not saying Ronnie was flattered by the 10-1 win, because he played absolutely superb. But... Uh, is, you've got to say, Tip Jai never turned up, really. On Sunday afternoon, that was just wonderful to watch, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's why when people always ask me, you know, who do you fancy? If Ronnie O'Sullivan plays his best, he's practically unbeatable. So I've always got to say, well, he's the, he's the man they've all got to beat. And uh, I, th that is exactly what happened. And, and that performance will have put the frightness into a lot of people. Uh, Ding Jun Wei, his next opponent, I don't think he'll have it as easy as he did against Tip Jion Nu, but he seems to have the Indian side over uh, Ding. So, uh, yeah, I think Ronnie's still a uh, favourite in my book. Is he favourite I mean, in yours? Uh, he is now, yeah. I mean, look, yeah. Yeah. It, you know... Being an after-timer, John, I mean, that 9-2 to two for Ronnie at the beginning of a tournament looks massive, yeah. doesn't it? Ronnie's now into 5-2 to two clear favourite, Judd Trump's second favourite, at around 11-4, to 3-1. to one. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people would be disappointed with Judd. I mean, he could quite easily have gone out to Tom Ford. Tom Ford, as I said at the time, very heavy scorer. But Tom just doesn't seem, when he sees the winning line, he just tightens up a little bit. But I have to say that I thought Judd was quite impressive. I thought some of his safety play was good, some of his tactical game was good, which you need if you're going to go all the way in the World Championship. And uh, although he's straight through it, appears, on paper, I was quite impressed the way he handled the pressure when it really mattered. And I think Judd, uh, yeah, he's, he's looking good in that top half to me. I mean, obviously, we'll talk about Ronnie again in a moment. Ronnie was just outstanding and the 10-1, but... Isn't it the first round, for Judd's point of view, just getting through it, isn't it? And then getting oh, yeah, to longer format, yeah. three sessions. Yes. And also the fact that the crucible curse, uh, you know, he had that to contend with. And Tom Ford, I mean, look, he nearly made a maximum in the first frame. You know, so he was playing well. As I say, it's just unfortunate. Tom just doesn't seem to have that temperament to, to take him over the line in these big events. But uh, no, I think it was a good workout for Judd. And he'll, he'll have watched Ronnie play, and he'll know that he'll have to play at his best. It, it, you know, if it does happen, uh, the dream final, and this is no disrespect to any other player, the dream final would be Judd Trump, Ronnie O'Sullivan. That would be mouthwatering. Just going back to Judd, John, did we see a maturity in Judd? Because three or four years ago, when it was possibly going a bit wrong in the middle of that match, He'd have gone for some silly pots, wouldn't he, and possibly thrown it away. But he dug in, didn't he? Kept to his mm. game plan and got himself over the line. I think you're absolutely right, Mark. I think two or three seasons ago, he'd have lost. You know, I remember the year he lost to Rory McLeod, you know. But that was the Judd Trump of a few years ago. 
This time he decided to dig in. As I say, he played some good safety. His tactical side of the game was good. And, uh, okay, people turn around and say he was let off the hook a couple of times. But he was still in a position that if he was let off the hook, to take advantage. And we saw a lot more mature Judd Trump in this. And, as I say, that will, I think will stand him in good stead for the rest of the tournament. Let's go back to Ronnie. It's well documented. He's a complex character, isn't he? Mm -hmm. but he does seem very, very relaxed. In his interview after the match, he was saying... He's pleased there's no crowd and there's not that. You know what it's like in Sheffield. You know, mm. it can be a bit of a circus, can't it? And especially around Ronnie. Oh, yeah. And just getting in the stage door is a bit of an achievement, particularly for Ronnie. But I thought the key thing I heard, that he's got Steve Peters in his corner. And that is important for Ronnie. Because as, 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 as you always think, you know, you're there on your own. You haven't got all your friends around you like you normally would have. So you're isolated a little bit. So to have Steve Peters in his corner, just to keep the lid on, if you like, uh, temperament and everything else, that would be good for Ronnie. And, uh, well, as we say, I mean, if he performs like that for the rest of the tournament, he's going to take uh, a lot of beating. But to have Steve Peters in his corner, I thought was a very, very important fact. And I've heard from a couple of people behind the scenes, John, it's the most relaxed I've seen him at the Crucible in a number mm. of years. Yeah, well, as, as, as you so rightly say, I mean, from Ronnie getting from his hotel, he's got to pull up outside the stage door, run through a barrage of people all wanting his autograph and pictures and this, that and the other. I mean, I, 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 I go through it and I'm only in the commentary book. I must have signed his autograph book 40, every year for 40 years. You know, but uh, they're the fans of snooker. Ronnie appreciates that, but it's just nice to be able to walk in the door and just concentrate on the job in hand. and. Yeah, seems to suit Ronnie, you know, it seems to uh, be right up his street. And how do you see the second round match then, Ronnie O'Sullivan versus uh, Ding Jun Wei? Well, I think the thing is with uh, Ronnie and, and, and other players will have noticed, Ding Jun Wei will think in his mind he'll have to play his absolute best to get a result. And just the fact that you have to think like that puts you under pressure. Because every time you miss a shot or you don't take advantage of a situation, you get down on yourself. He you can't afford to do that. But uh, I don't think it's going to be as easy for Ronnie as it was against Sit Jai and New. But uh, he seems to play well against Ding. He respects him as a player. And Ding blows a bit on cold. And let's be fair, Ding could well have got knocked out by Mark King in that first round. I know there's pressure on the seeds in the first round, but... Ding wasn't that impressive, and if you just look at that form line of the first round, you've got to fancy Ronnie very strongly. And when you see Ronnie playing like that on Sunday afternoon, is there a better sight in snooker than that? Well, funny enough, I was watching the BBC coverage, and Jason Mohammed is filling in for uh, uh, Hazel Irving because uh, she couldn't make it because of the quarantine and what have you. He was saying in all the sports that he's covered, rugby, football, everything, that there's no finer sight in sport than Ronnie O'Sullivan playing snooker at the top of his game. And I think that sums it up. It's poetry in motion. It's artistic. It's everything you ever dream of for our game in the shot window, which the Betfred World Championship is. For Ronnie to perform like that was just magical. Absolutely magical. He's uh, won it five times, Ronnie O'Sullivan. Uh, Judd Trump won it last year, of course. They could meet in the final, but there'll be plenty of players uh, trying to uh, stop them reaching the final. Let's talk about some second-round matches. Um, John Higgins versus uh, Kurt Mafflin. I, I think this break might have helped, John. Yeah, it could do. Uh, Jimmy White was very keen on Kurt Mafflin in his first match against Dave Gilbert because Jimmy plays, practices a lot with Kurt. And he was telling me what a good player he is. Now, of course, beating Dave Gilbert was a very good performance because I rate Dave Gilbert very highly. John Higgins is another matter. John Higgins can stop people playing. You asked me the other day, why does John Higgins like the World Championship? Longer frames, if John's just not hitting the ball correctly, he can tighten things up. He can play three or four types of game. Can Kurt Maff Mafflin cope with that change of strategy that John Higgins will throw everything at him as he's proved in the last three years being the Betfred World Final. So 
It's a different kettle of fish, but from what Jimmy says to me, this Kurt Mathlin is well capable of getting a result here, but uh, he'll have to play well. He'll have to play well because John Higgins is not a walkover or a lie down for anybody. And now it's three sessions. That just suits John completely yeah, as well, yeah. doesn't it? And, and that's where all the experience and, and there's no doubt John Higgins is the best best all-round snooker player that's ever played the game. And uh, he's proved that. He might not be as good as he was a few years ago, but he makes up for it with the other side of the game. He's got an A game, he's got a B game, you know, where we see other players, if they're not on their A game, then they can't win. John Higgins can win with an A, B or C game. And so I'd, I'd make him favourite against Kurt Mathlin, but from what I'm hearing from Jimmy, it's not going to be easy. And this Kurt Mathlin, if he really believes he can get a result against a legend, and that's what you've got to overcome. John Higgins is a legend, so you've got to put that out of your mind and just say, right, I am playing well enough, I'm good enough to get a result. And who's to say he might do? Uh, another cracker in the uh, second round, Mark Williams versus Stuart Bingham. I was watching Mark Williams on Saturday nights, and the way mm. he was queuing, I was just thinking yeah. it was like watching a Rolls Royce play snooker. He is cool as, cool as a cucumber, really. I mean, I love watching him play. I mean, and these fast tables at the Crucible and everywhere else, they just suit his style of play. He likes to just roll balls in, drop the ball in. And it's amazing because a couple of years ago, I thought he was on his way down and he was out of the game. But then he came through, won the World Championship two years ago. And uh, he, he's, he's kept that level of form up. Stuart Bingham, though, is a very heavy scorer. And of the two, I think Stewart scores heavier than Mark Williams at the moment. But Mark Williams is a very, very crafty player. Uh, and his safety play could just give him the edge over uh, Stewart. But if it comes to a, a potting break building match, then I, I'd, I'd favour Stuart Bingham. I think it, it's that close. But I think Stewart's the heavier scorer the, of, of the two. And... Um Great news after Mark Williams' uh, victory uh, over Alan McManus. He said he realised in lockdown that he's not going to retire. He's going to carry on playing. And <laughs> well, that's good news. So, it, no, which, is, which is great news. And, he, you know, yeah. he, said, he said that, you know, at the end of the day, he's, he's turned the hobby into his job compared to his dad that used to go down the mine. Yeah, well, this is it. You know, I think this lockdown has given us all a new perspective on life. You know, things we took for granted. Things that we thought, oh, well, I can do that or not do that. Now you appreciate how lucky you are. And, and as I say, to be doing something that you love doing, you know, and getting paid for it and having great success. I mean, you can't turn your back on that. And I'm really pleased to hear that because Mark Williams has been a great asset for this game. And as I say, just beautiful, smooth cueist and lovely to watch. Um. As we record this, John, we've said we're going to give £200 for every century, and if we get to 80, we'll give £25,000 to Snooker's charity, Jesse May. We're on 33 already. Uh, I mm. think we're going, to, we're going to smash the 80, and we could even be pushing towards, I know it's early days, last year's record of 100 ton-ups. Unbelievable. 100 ton-ups. Yeah, that would be amazing. And, and you can see it happening. Now, whether it's because there's not the crowds there or, or what have you, you know, and there's not the U's and R's when you get near as, uh, the hundreds or the maximums and what have you, the players seem to be excelling. But it is a point, uh, when you play on the table with a new cloth, uh, they have a tendency to have a bit of a sheen on the pocket, so they do slide in a little bit better on the first couple of days. So maybe the pockets will get a little bit tighter. I saw that ball that uh, Anthony McGill spotted last night against Jack Lazowski, the blue, and it sort of knocked three times but knew the password. And that's how tight these pockets look. And that was a great win, by the way, for Anthony McGill. But that is a tremendous pop, rattled but went in. And I think uh, they are accepting a, a pacey ball, and particularly ones just off the cushion. And if that starts happening, it's food and drink for these top players. You know, they're not frightened of a ball running it down the cushion. So you're going to see lots of big breaks. And Well, Jesse May's charity will, uh, will favour, so it's a great gesture from Betfred. Yeah, it was a great blue by Anthony McGill, wasn't it, to uh, oh, win that match? tremendous. Uh, just a final question, uh, John, I'm going to get you on a few times during the Betfred World Snooker Championship, but uh, 
What's been your highlight? We're on day five. What's been your highlight so far? I think my highlight, to be perfectly honest, was Ronnie. Because you always look for somebody who's going to add that little sprinkle of stardust. And he did that Sunday afternoon and made us all appreciate that's how the game should be played. That's what everybody should be trying to do, play like that. It's very difficult because he's a genius. But that to me was the, just set the Betfred World Championship going, you know, and saying, this is what it's like when he's played at the highest level. And it was great drama, great theatre. And watching a genius at work, what more can you ask? Well, thanks very much for your uh, time, John. And like I said, we'll have plenty more from John throughout the Betfred World Snooker Championship. Why don't you all stay in and watch snooker? Betfred, proud sponsor of the World Snooker Championship.